On Newsbank Heaven this week, we'll meet Ian Tootle, who's looking for a machine that's big and comfortable and capable of covering thousands of miles. We'll have another featured used bike, another riding tip, and some more legal advice. On Newsbike Heaven this week, we meet Ian Tootle, who is a used car dealer from New Yorkshire. Ian currently owns an 883 Harley, but would like something with a little more luxury and comfort for those long journeys. Hello and welcome to this week's show, and I have Ian with me. Now, Ian, you're currently a Harley owner, aren't you? Yes. And what are you looking for today? Something comfortable that I can sit on for two hours and, and not get off and be worn out. Right. And what that, do you use your bike for? Uh, occasionally business, but mainly pleasure. Right. For two hours, you don't have much pleasure. Well. <laughs> That's why you want one of these today. Exactly. Right. So, what's your budget? Uh, around £12,000. OK. Well, you know, we've got three bikes here that one of them actually, I do blow your budget, but that's just me. Uh, we've got the BMW K1200 LT. That's £10,000. Right. Honda Goldwing GL1500. This is £12,500. And the Harley-Davidson V-Rod which is actually £13,000, that's, that's the budget blower. And it's a bit right. of a wild card entry. Mm -hmm. What do you think of these three? Um, well, they look very comfortable, certainly, these two. Um, the Harley looks obviously very different to the other two. Yeah. Um, I, difficult to say without riding them, really. Well, funny you should say that, because we're going to actually let you loose on them. All right. But before we do, we're going to go to Paul, who's going to give you some facts and figures. OK. OK. First up this week, Ian is BMW's top of the range tourer, the K1200 LT. Introduced in 1999, the LT has an 1171cc horizontal inline four cylinder motor, which develops a claimed 98 brake horsepower. Power delivery is smooth thanks to a slick five speed gearbox and a nice low maintenance shaft drive to the rear. At 378 kilos, the LT is just about the heaviest production motorcycle on the road today. But that doesn't mean it won't handle. In fact, we think you'll be pleasantly surprised by its agility once you've got it on the move. This bike is from 1999 on a T registration and it's covered 19,500 miles. It's in immaculate condition and if it takes your fancy, you'll get just a fiver change from £10,000. If you think the BMW feels big, then just wait till you climb aboard Honda's GL1500 Goldwing. For many, this machine is the ultimate in long-distance tourers. The fact that it's remained virtually unchanged since its launch way back in 1988 is testament to its ability to transport you, a pillion, a huge amount of luggage and even a trailer, if you like, across entire continents in supreme luxury. The motor is a 1520cc flat six cylinder unit, which kicks out a super smooth 100 brake horsepower. And like the BMW, it has a reverse gear to assist you at low speed maneuvering and also for posing on the local supermarket car park. It's a fact that you'll do well to find two identical gold wings. Owners do like to personalize their bikes. This one has everything bar the kitchen sink. It's a year 2000 bike which has covered just over 17,500 miles. Fitted to it are over 2,500 pounds worth of extras, including a CD stacker system, a CB radio, luggage racks, a spoiler, a rider's backrest, extra lights, tons of chrome and lots more. It's up for sale today at 12,500 pounds. And finally, a machine that could never be described as a long distance tourer, Harley Davidson's V-Rod. You see, Ian, we thought that with you already being a Harley owner, you might just like to stay faithful to the brand. The V-Rod is without doubt Harley's most exclusive machine. You could probably count on one hand the number of times you've seen one out on the twisty Yorkshire roads. It's also their most powerful machine, and in a straight line it would give any decent sports bike something to think about. Bends and roundabouts, however, are a slightly different matter. Just be careful you don't grind the heels off your boots as you tip it in. Ground clearance isn't exactly generous on a V-Rod. A new one of these retails at £14,000, but we've heard stories of second-hand V-Rods selling for more than that. Such is their exclusivity. Or is that just that Harley can't make them fast enough? This bike here is a 2001 X demo model. It's showing just over 3,000 miles. It's in immaculate condition and it's on sale at £13,000. So there you go, Ian. That was Paul with a few facts and figures. Did you learn anything there? 
Yeah, a few tips and yeah. a few interesting things. Okay, well, we're going to let you out on the BMW, okay. firstly. Have you ever ridden one of these before? No, not this particular one. Right, okay, well, it's nice and big for you anyway. <laughs> Hopefully it'll be what you're looking for. So, I mean, it's got a radio, it's got everything. Mm -hmm. But, you know, don't be too busy playing that you do anything with it, will okay. you? Okay. <laughs> All right then, All right. enjoy yourself. So while Leon's off having a play on the BMW, we're over to Paul with this week's used bike review. Now you know me, I like to be a little bit different, never really been one to follow the crowd, and that's true when it comes to bikes as well. And if you're looking for something that is completely different, then you need to look in those dirty little dark corners of your dealer's showrooms where nobody ever goes. And you might find something like this, a very strange looking thing, it's a Suzuki GS1200 SS. And some would say it's a perfect example of what Japanese bike builders do on a Friday afternoon. Perhaps a little cruel, but not that far from the truth. The 1200 SS is retro styling gone just that little bit too far. Climb aboard though and it feels every bit the modern machine. It's surprisingly comfortable and easy to ride and although the motor does feel a little flat at low revs, things certainly come to life once you take it above about 4000. It tips into bends beautifully and really does give loads of confidence to the rider. The truth is that despite its rather bizarre looks, it doesn't feel any different from any of the other big engine retro machines on the market today. And by now you'd be forgiven for thinking that this looks much the same as Suzuki's 1200 Bandit, which of course is what it's loosely based around. It's not all Bandit though, of course there are some unique features that you will only find on this 1200 SS model. The most obvious is this fairing. I mean look at it, it's off uh, a nuclear submarine actually. No it's not, but it looks like it. It's absolutely monstrous. Reminds me of one of the old Mike Halewood TT bikes from many years ago. But it's, it is absolutely huge. You can't really see through it unless you put your head there right down like that, you can't see through it. But it does give you quite a lot of protection, just get a bit of wind on your helmet and I reckon I could probably Read the paper, do the crossword and have a fag under here at 70 miles an hour quite easily. But uh, it is monstrous, but different, very, very different. The tank also is unique to this bike. There's no other bike that has this particular tank. As with the rest of the bodywork, massive amount of plastic down here covering these twin shocks. And the frame, although it looks like a bandit, particularly this little section down here, isn't actually. It's a completely different frame and you'll only find that on this bike. The rest of it, however, is off a bandit, or should I say bandits. The motor is actually a 1200cc Bandit engine. Nothing different with that, that's the same engine you'll find in the UK bike, the 1200cc 2000 model Bandit. But the carburettors are off a 600, and we know that because we've measured these. These are actually 32mm carbs, the 1200 should have 36mm carbs, so you'd think power would be down, but this has been on a dyno without that can on it, with the standard can on it, and it measured 95 brake horsepower, which is about right for a 1200 Bandit, near as damn it, so power is fine. The wheels and things and the brakes are all 1200 band. We've got six pots on the front there, so they're pretty damn good. Returning to the rear, that swing arm there is different, of course. That is the same as you'll find on a Japanese spec 1200 band. It's all getting very, very complicated, isn't it? And of course, we're used to seeing monoshocks. This has got twin shocks, and they look pretty ordinary and pretty unsophisticated, don't they? But if you were to take a look under the seat, you'll see that mounted up here and tucked away very neatly are the remote reservoirs for the shocks. Now, I've never seen that before, and I think that's... Uh, Quite a smart way of doing it. By now you're probably thinking this is a real parts bin special and somebody's built this out of all bits and pieces, but they haven't. This is a proper model. You could go to Japan and you could buy a GS1200 SS and it would look exactly like this. But would you really want to? Well, thanks for that, Paul. And while you're away, Ian has returned with the BMW. So, Ian, what did you think? Um, surprisingly good, actually. Mm -hmm. um, once you've got over the initial size of it uh, and weight of it, um, it's relatively comfortable. Yeah, um, it's a big cumbersome thing, isn't it? Though? It is. Yeah. But surprisingly enough, once you've had five or ten minutes on it, that seems to get, that, that seems to go out from your mind. Right. So now it's got the adjustable seat height. Could you? It was it a comfortable bike to ride? Very comfortable. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, the handlebars are a bit strange when you first ride it. In what way? Well, the rate right back, and you seem to be. I don't know, sat a long way from the, from, the, from the dashboard and the, the front wheel. Yeah. Um, but yes, very comfortable, mm -hmm. uh, surprisingly nimble, uh, good performance, torquey, yeah. smooth, yeah. quick, the brakes were good. Um, the only thing I couldn't quite get right was the screen. 
for stop. Because that's an electronic screen, isn't it? It's adjustable. Yes, ele yeah. electrically adjustable, but I couldn't quite get that in the right position. So what were you finding then? Still uh, a bit? Some buffeting at speed. But you're happy enough with this then? I mean, this does everything, obviously, a BMW. Uh, yeah, uh, surprisingly good. Surprisingly Great. good. We're going to move on now to a, a, the Gold Wing, which is big. They'll see you coming in this one. So mm. now this obviously has all the tricks on it as well. And mm. uh, a driver's backrest. Have you ever ridden a Gold Wing before? Yes, I have some time ago. Right. Well, it's going to be interesting to see what you think then when you've jumped off that one straight onto this one. Mm. So do you want to get your helmet on? Yeah. And tell us what you think. OK. OK. So while Ian has a little test on the Honda Goldwing, it's over to PC Pulfrey and Paul for this week's legal advice. Thank you, Fran. Well, this week we're talking about luggage or carrying things on your bike, and this is my favourite bit of kit, this, Chris, my trusty old tank bag. Not wrong with that, is it? No, it's a purpose-built piece of equipment. Magnetic, obviously nice and secure. Uh, you can go up to another level. Well, it'll come up here, this yeah. thing, yeah. Just to yeah. make sure you don't obviously get too high, too wide, so you can't actually yep. see your speedometer. <laughs> uh, right. And uh, manoeuvre the handlebars. All right, so that's OK. This bike next to us, we've got a top box. Again, purpose job it. Totally legal and everything, yeah? Yeah, again, purpose made. Uh, secures to the bike on a proper frame. And obviously, you can have matching panniers coming down either side. Right. Just one thing to bear in mind, obviously, when you've got hard luggage, you can carry quite a lot. I mean, that's a 48 litre capacity on that one. Mm -hmm. And you can go probably 50 litres either side here. Just make sure you put the heavy items down in your panniers and leave the top box and the tank bag for your lighter stuff like you know, your waterproofs and right. the trash helmet stuff like that. Because there is a, a legal weight, a uh, maximum weight, isn't there on a bike? It tells you in the handbooks, doesn't it? Yeah, every manufacturer will give you the guidelines as to what the weights are. Yeah. If you go beyond those, then you're obviously open to committing offence on the Road Traffic Act right. or the Road Vehicle Construction Use Regulations, actually. But also, again, going back to the old insurance angle, if you're riding a fall off and it finds out the vehicle's grossly overweight, right. there's a potential reduction in the insurance claim there. OK, right, so this is purpose-built luggage for the job, safe and secure. This over here, Chris, uh, certainly is not purpose-built and it doesn't look very secure. So do you actually come across things like this? Quite yeah. often, actually, yeah. Do you? Yeah, the most common one is the, uh, you know, the little step-through moped, guy oh. going fishing. Yeah? He's got his great big pike poles, whatever they are, stuffed over his shoulder, right. six foot long, something like that, and he's big basket full of maggots wherever they carry on uh, <laughs> on the bike there. Not unusual, potentially lethal, yeah. and it actually falls into the same category of offences as uh, insecure load for big HGVs. Oh, right. So you're right. talking £500,000 potential fine. Wow. Uh, because he's talking it. about load likely to cause danger. Well, Not only to a rider, but to other road users. Yeah, and the test would be as simple as that. Would it? You pulled someone practice. up and said, hang on a minute, I'm sorry mate. Yeah. I mean, to, to, <laughs> to the ordinary person in the street, that is clearly not secure, yeah. it's dangerous, right. and it's likely to fall off. And it is an offence? Straight on. Big money then? Uh, absolutely, yeah. Blimey. Right, OK. We better get some more bungees on this then. <laughs> well, that's it for part one. Join us in part two when Ian will be back with the Goldwing and we'll be setting him off on the V-Rod. And Paul will also be back with some riding advice. See you after the break. Welcome back to Used Bike Heaven. Now, if you were with us in part one, you'll know we're with Ian, who currently has a Harley 883. He's looking for something a little more comfortable. So we sent him out on the BMW 1200 LT. He liked that, no problems with that. Then we sent him out on the Honda Goldwing. And I've yet to find out what he thinks, because you're just about to tell me. What did you think? Uh, big. Yes. Comfortable. Yeah. Um, didn't like it quite as much as the BMW. OK, why was that? Um, Comfort. Comfort-wise, uh, very much on par with the BMW. Yep. And you sat, you sat in it. It felt like you sat in it rather than on it. Right. Uh, so you were seat effectively lower down, were you, on this one? It seemed it. Although the, looking at the two there, the, the the seat heights looked the same. Right. But you, but but you felt like you were sat in the bike rather than on top of it. Right. With the BMW. Okay. Now you've got the backrest on on the Goldwing. Yeah, which are, which is adjustable, I believe. But yeah. It's not actually adjusted in the correct position for me, so right. it was, was pushing me forward a little bit. Okay. Now this is a 1500, obviously. The BMW is a 12. Did you feel a power difference? No, I thought difference? the I thought the performance of the BMW was superior. Oh, did you? Yeah, and, right. the, and the brakes as well. I thought the brakes were much better on the BMW than, than the, the Goldwing. OK. Well, we know what you think to that then. Right. A few pros, a few, few cons. Mm -hmm. Now we're on to the, the Harley, which I can only describe to you as a wild card entry, because everybody's going to be thinking, well, that's nothing like those two, which it isn't. But because at the moment you're a Harley man, aren't you? 
Well, I'm hardly in Harley now. <laughs> well, I've you own a, one. I own one, yeah. yeah. So we thought, right, Harley Davidson. We could go cruiser or we could go exclusive. All right. These are, you don't see them very often. So we thought we'd try and tempt you with one of these. What do you think to the looks of it? I like the looks of it. It's it amazing great. looking, isn't it? It looks very good, yeah. Yeah. Now, it's £13,000, this one. Right. Uh, it's an ex-demo. Mm. Um, so we need to know what you think to it. We know what you look, okay. what it looks like to you. Mm -hmm. So you're going to get your kit on and tell us what you think? Okay. Okay then. So while Ian does his third and final test, we're over to Paul, who's going to give you some more riding advice. Counter steering. What is counter steering and what does it do? Well, we've read about it in all the riders' manuals and all the racers talk about it. It's simply pushing the bar the wrong way, turning the wrong way, if you like. Counter means the opposite, doesn't it? So if I push on the right, although my wheel is turning slightly to the left, the bike will actually go to the right, incredibly. If I push left, it will go to the left. Very, very effective. I will attempt to demonstrate. So here we are in a straight line. We're in first gear, nice and slow. The bike is well balanced. And if I push on the right hand bar, you see what happens. The bike flicks itself quite severely, very effectively to the right. So if I now push on the left, the reverse will apply. So you can see just how effective it is. Push on the right, the bike will go right. Push on the left hand bar, the bike will go left. And I'm only going very slow. The faster I was to go, the more effective it would be and the more flicky it would be. So push left to go left, push right to go right. That's all that counter steering is. It's no mythical art, no black art. And if you're not sure, find yourself a big empty space, a big car park somewhere and have a little go. And you'd be surprised just how manoeuvrable your machine can be. Well, thank you, Paul, and while you were away, Ian returned with the Harley. Ian, what did you think to the Harley? I'm very impressed with the engine. Um, for a twin, it doesn't feel like a twin. could be a four-cylinder bike. Are you a twin man? Not particularly, no. Right, OK. Uh, but uh, performance very impressive. I think the looks are great. But I can't quite understand what, what, what they're aiming at with the bike. Um, right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, we, we've been a bit unfair because we've thrown it in with, with the cruisers. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, people think of Harleys as cruiser bikes, don't they? And, you know, I mean, mm -hmm. this is it's a pose machine, really, isn't it? I suppose so, yeah. Mm. Uh, and it does look great. Uh, I thought the engine was great. The performance is good. Plenty of power, then? Plenty of power. Yeah. Uh, in any gear. Yeah. Um, very little ground clearance. In fact, I've just scraped the heel of my shoe coming around a roundabout on it. So gra ground clearance is very poor. Right. Well, you've got that kind of, um, it's like the chopper style almost, isn't it? Your legs are very outstretched Leg, on Legs this. forward, yeah. Sat yeah. with legs forward. Yeah. And how did you find that comfort-wise? I found it fine. Although, as, as you uh, reach higher speeds, then, uh, and you tend to get pushed back a little bit because of the lack of a fairing, then, yeah. then um, it feels a little bit stranger mm. at higher speeds. So it's fair to say you wouldn't want to be doing a couple of hours on this? Uh, not, certainly not at high speeds. No. And I did weave a little bit as well at high speeds. Did it? Yes. Mm. Right. Well, I mean, like you say, it's <laughs> we've been a bit unfair. We just because obviously you do. This bike is just. I mean, it looks amazing. I think, and I think you'd you'd have to have one. Great looking bike. You'd yeah. have one in your garage if if you got other bikes, perhaps, or mm. you just wanted a toy. But I'm not not. Not something you buy for everyday use, okay. I don't think. Well, don't give me too much away, because, I mean, I, I, you never know. I might have complete, completely converted you into not wanting to cruise and just wanting to pose. Right. So, what we're going to do now is, we know what you think of the Harley. Can you remember briefly what you thought to the K1200? Good and bad points. The good points, very comfortable. Mm -hmm. For a big, heavy bike, once you get used to the strange handlebars and, and, and riding position, maybe, mm. um, for a big heavy bike, very easy to ride, very easy to, to throw around. Felt relatively sporty. Right. Um, good performance, good brakes. But you felt a bit with the wind buffeting and the, the handlebars. You couldn't, couldn't get the screen uh, in the right position to stop buffeting. Yep. Um, but other than that, quite okay. impressed. Yep. Um, and certainly nice looking and well put together. Right. The gold wing, good and bad points. Um, bad points, garish, look, too garish looking. Maybe that's the extras that that are on there. I don't know what they look like as standard. Yeah. Um, perhaps a little bit easier to ride than the Goldwing, considering they're a similar size and weight. Mm -hmm. um, but the performance is certainly not as good as the BMW. BMW, And right. the brakes were certainly not as good as the BMW. Right. So they've both got little pros and cons then. I mean, don't give me too much away, but have you decided on 
which bike you would go for out of these three? Yes, I think so. You have, right. Well, before you tell me, we're going to go to Paul, who's going to give us a recap. All right, okay. okay. Well, it's decision time, Ian. Will you go for BMW's K1200 LT at £9,995? There's no doubt that it fits the bill as far as long distance touring ability goes, and you seem quite happy with its handling and performance. Or will you choose our dressed up GL1500 Goldwing with all its bells and whistles at £12,500? You had a slight gripe about the comfort, but we're certain that that could be put right with a small adjustment to the rider's backrest. On then to the V Rod at £13,000. And we're all agreed that it's definitely different, but is it just that little bit too different for you? In a straight line, it will leave both the wing and the beamer way behind. But with no screen to protect you from the wind and rain, you'd do well to sustain that kind of performance for any length of time. So come on, Ian, which is it to be? So there you go, Ian. That was Paul with the recap. Put me out of my misery. Which one of these three is it going to be? The BMW. Right, OK. I thought you might say that, to be fair, but tell me why. Uh, the price, um, the build quality, yeah, um, and overall, it does exactly what I wanted something to do. Yeah. Well, you liked the brakes, you liked everything about this bike, didn't you? So, yeah. Yeah, the comfort. Brilliant. And it's within your budget, which is unlike me, really. Yeah. To get anything with anybody's budget. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Well, fantastic. Well, I'm glad we were able to find you your mile muncher then. Thank you very much. OK. OK. And you're not Harley man, after all. See you next week for some more Used Bike Heaven. On Used Bike Heaven next week, we're helping Honda Blackbird owner Mike McCabe to find a second bike. We'll have another riding tip, some more legal advice, and there'll be another Used Bike Review.